official, but we come today to teach you how you might overcome, that you might overcome. And uh, what Jesus did on the cross is still in effect. Amen. Is still relevant today as if he had died on the cross yesterday. Amen. Amen. It's as real and it's effective today. That's what the Lord's Supper is, is about. It's reminding us, I was asked this week, if I thought that baptism or the Lord's Supper had any part in saving us, I said, absolutely not. We do it because we're saved. Amen. Not to be saved, but the Lord, the baptism is the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, identification. The Lord suffers speaking the same thing. His death, his shed blood, his resurrected uh, body, and so forth. But the Lord's Supper reminds us that uh, he wanted us to keep. He said the church to practice this without fail till he come again. He wanted us to be reminded of the price he paid for your individual salvation, the price that he paid for your debt of sin, and it's relevant today, here and now. That's why he wanted us to continue that without fail till he come. So Jesus died. He was buried on the third day. He arose, and before he ascended, one of his last words on earth was that he has all authority, all power in heaven and in earth. Amen. If we could translate that in common man language, I'm in charge. That's what he meant. Yeah. He arose a victor. He's in charge. He's a sovereign Lord God. He didn't come to take sides. He came to take over, amen? Yeah. Yes, he did. And he is in, in charge because he's Lord. And uh, if uh, you're not letting him call the shots for you, then you're not an overcomer. Face the fact, you're yeah. Not, yeah. not an overcomer. And the cross is the point of reference here. And we see who died and why he died, and the victory that was accomplished. And all of that was transferred to his church. His living church was a, more than an organization. Amen. It's an organism of the body of Jesus Christ spiritually. Amen. So Jesus overcame Satan. And how do we overcome Satan? Number one, they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. They overcome him by the cross. And the blood that Jesus shed on the cross had the power for them to personally claim and apply to their life in the face of the devil. And you can plead the blood of the Lamb shed on the cross. Plead it against your sin Amen. and plead it against your adversary of the devil. And you can overcome. They overcome uh, the word by the word of the blood of the lamb. Number two, by the word of their testimony. By the cross, number one. Number two, by their confession. By the word of their testimony. And uh, you're not overcoming the uh, uh, what you need to overcome if you're a secret Christian. I want to deal with that so-called secret discipleship. I've, when I was a boy uh, visiting with my dad, we came across people that didn't want to identify with the church and didn't want to get involved, and, but they said they were saved and going to heaven, which I didn't believe, and I don't believe now, but because they weren't willing to confess Christ publicly. Mm -hmm. They wasn't willing to identify with him. They wasn't willing to follow him in believer's baptism and to unite with his uh, called out assembly of the church. And they wasn't willing to. They 
use the term secret disciple. And they use uh, like Nicodemus. He was a secret disciple. Well, maybe he was at first. I don't know. I think he stirred up the Sanhedrin quite a bit. Amen. But he took down the body of Jesus. I don't think that was secret. Amen. And uh, he buried him in Josephus, uh, not Josephus, uh, Joseph of Arimathea's too. I don't think that was secret either. But anyway, they hide behind this secret Christianity. Hey, you, that secret Christianity is just not going to float in the scripture. Yeah. It's just not going to work. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32 and uh, 33, if you don't confess him before men, he won't confess you before the Father in heaven. And if you deny him or refuse to confess him, he will refuse to confess you. I didn't say that. He said that. Amen. And Amen. Uh, the secret Christianity. Oh, how can somebody say they're following Christ and then they're not they're ashamed to associate with him yeah. or to confess him? And they hide their Christianity on the job. They hide it at school. They hide it in the neighborhood. They hide it in the community. They hide it around the relatives. If you're not a, an overcomer, you are a disgrace to grace. Amen. 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 And uh, you may be saved. You may go to heaven by the skin of your teeth. But I want to tell you what I believe. The Bible says heaven is 15 hundred miles high and that will cover many levels right that'll cover many floors 1500 miles and if you're a coward and won't confess Christ uh, and hide as a secret agent uh, a secret that uh, I personally think You'll get to the bottom floor. <laughs> this is a good time Bruce Isaac would say, think about it if you will. <laughs> All right, think about it. Secret discipleship. Brother, I'll tell you what, you need to stand up, fill in the gap, and if it costs you your life, stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, something that's why. The Bible calls for public confession. Amen. That's why we walk the aisle in the church. It's a public confession. That's why we're baptized publicly, identified with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Uh, we're identified with him. And we're identified with his blood bought church because it takes scriptural baptism to get you in, into a scriptural church. At least that's the Bible example. Amen. That's what we have scripture for. We don't they say, well, why be baptized? Well, that's his plan. That's his program. That's what he ordained, not me. Amen. God ordained baptism. And I know before John the Baptist, that's how the Orthodox Jew would proselyte a Gentile. And before he could become a Jew, he had to be baptized representing doing away with his former life. And now he's now becoming a Jew. Well, then when John the Baptist come on the scene, there's now a preparing for the bride of Christ. And he's, he's gathering material for Christ to build his church with. And he chose baptism to separate people because it did represent putting away an old way of life to take a new way of life, which was the evidence of repentance, and he was preaching baptism unto repentance. And when Jesus come, he, uh, why was he baptized? Because of sin? No. Because he got born again? No. He got baptized for identification. Amen. And he identified with those believers that were preparing for the Messiah. Amen. And so out of that material, Jesus called and ordained the, the church. And the church began after he got out of the wilderness of temptation. So to deny him is to be denied. 
Matthew 10, 32, 33, also in Luke 12, 8 through 9. Now, if you're too big a coward to be associated with Jesus Christ, then you're a weak, pathetic, sorry excuse for even being a Christian. Amen. How can you expect anything to come from God if you don't want to publicly confess and follow him? Some people don't want Jesus as Supreme Lord. They want to be the main boss of their life, right? Yeah. They want to call the shots. They want to be in charge. And then they want a free pass to heaven when they die. Somehow it doesn't synchronize with Bible born again lordship, trusting Christ, does it? Amen. Just doesn't synchronize. I have, you're not going to like this, and I don't like it myself. <laughs> But I have more respect for a homosexual who comes out of the closet than I do for a secret disciple of Jesus who's too ashamed, intimidated, and cowardly yeah. to confess being a Christian. Yeah. I have more respect for that. Anyway, they overcome him by the word of their testimony. Listen, God the Father put everything under the authority of his son. Yes, sir. Philippians 2.10. I love this. It's going to come to pass at the name of Jesus. Amen. Every knee shall bow the things in heaven, things in earth, and even the things under the earth. Amen. That's them in hell, isn't it? And even every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise God, what a day that'll be. We just may start, we may break loose singing that song when it happens. What a day that'll be when Jesus is crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Are you ashamed to go public for Jesus? What about your witness? What about your testimony? What about it? Are you ashamed of the Christ? that hung on the cross, your sins were all laid upon him, he suffered hell for you, according to the Bible, Psalm 22, he suffered the equivalent of hell for you, and you'll see symptoms of hell described in the very suffering of Jesus. Sure. You'll Amen. study it out real, real close, the hell of the cross. Oh, if your salvation is not good enough to live by, it's not good enough to die Amen. by. That's my opinion. Amen. You're going to, you say, I can't, they're not going to live it. You're not going to follow Christ. And then you expect that, that that salvation to be the true salvation. There's truth and there's false. And the Bible says, by their fruit, you'll know them. And if you don't have fruit, you don't have evidence. Amen. 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 Isaiah 53, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, chastisement of our peace laid upon us, by his stripes we are chilled. All the like sleep of God's strength, Lord, laid on him the iniquity of all. It leads the Father to bruise him, to see the travail of his soul when he made him an offering for sin. And then you're going to tell me you're too ashamed to follow him and to confess him before men. That's a privilege to say, I follow the Lord. I realize the name Christian has been so generalized, it's not worth it. That's right. But brother, you can show the genuine stuff, and you can show the real stuff, amen? amen. And to say, well, I don't know about a lot of people, but I know about that brother, amen? And we used to say that about Brother Wayne Sheffield, didn't we? Because he had the real stuff. Amen. And my, kid, my kids, well, they're pretty young then, and they brought up the hypocrisy. And it kind of amused me because I tried to quit. I started to preach at 16. And then I got so disappointed in people, so hurt, betrayed, and backstabbed by leading church members in the church. And, and, and they judged me and trashed my motives and said I was trying to take over the church. 16 years old, I'm going to take over the church and steal the money. <laughs> and they called out. I just said, could you give us a little money to buy some gospel tracts because we're running out of giving them out on the street corner. 
Well, that old Deacons, he got in that Deacons meeting and he told them that me and Harold Gardner was trying to take over that church. And I got so hurt, I sat there in the living room on Monday and I said, Dad, I quit. That's the way they are. I don't want to have anything to do with them. And I was sincere. I was throwing in the towel. I said, here I'm trying to serve God and trashing me and lying and slandering and all that. And uh, my dad just simply said, could I ask you a question? He said, who was it that died on the cross for you? And I said, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he named that deacon's name. He said, did he hang on the cross for you? I said, absolutely not. Then he said, who are you serving? Who are you doing it for? And then he verbally reprimanded me. And I felt like it was worse than his old-fashioned woman <laughs> he used to give me. I got a tongue wax. That's what I got. I remember after I was, by the that rings a bell, but after I got called to my first church, I got, I was given the most troublemaking church in the whole area. And, um, it was in the Southern Baptist Association, and so there was, I don't know how many churches, but the, the two families they sent to start that church had tore up every church they were members of, had caused every preacher they ever had not only to resign, but they got out of the ministry never to get back in. Now, that was my first congregation, and uh, I did all right for a while, and then the preaching manifested. It's amazing their sons and daughters are a young married couple. Man, they hung in there with me, uh, tooth and toenail, and, uh, and they, they were strong. But those old ones, they've got, they've said things and did things, and finally I couldn't take it anymore. One night, late at night, mom had already gone to bed, dad was watching 10 o'clock news. And I went in there and said, Dad, I, I need to resign. I don't know how. Tell me, how can I resign this church? He said, I don't know how. I've never done it. <laughs> and boy, you know, after a while, I was in there whining and belly and giving excuses and how hard I was having it. And I remember Mom coming out of that bedroom. She bolted out. She come down that hallway and I was sitting where I could see. Curl was in her hair, one of them old raggedy house coats, you know, when you've been married that long, it don't matter. And uh, she come out of that, and I, I've never seen her quite with that kind of anger. And she pointed her finger right at me, and she said, I don't want to ever hear my son talk about quitting ever again. And I felt like crawling back in my seat again, trying to disappear. And you know what? I just got up the next Sunday morning and hauled off and preached. Amen. And God Amen. gave me the victory. Amen. God doesn't want you to quit. God wants you to stand in the gap. Amen. Make up the head. You're going to be discouraged. You're going to be disheartened. The devil's going to shoot arrows in you. But just trust God. Amen. Put your arms around him. If you're not down, just Crawl up, get around your arms around the ankles of Jesus. Amen. They say, here I am, Lord, uh, help me. And he will, he will. Number three, they love not their life unto death. And when this means when they face death, they refuse to renounce Christ. Mm. And they, why? They loved him too much. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I believe. Amen. They would rather die than renounce Jesus because they were in a relationship of loving him. They loved him too much. Good, they loved him more than their Amen. self. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Heard Adrian Rogers preaching this morning on King's self. People love self. And that's the truth. He said that's the biggest problem in the church today. Just look in the mirror. And you'll see the problem. Amen, Brother Rogers. Amen. Preach on from the grave. Amen. Preach on from heaven. And listen, their love, listen, their love for Christ transcended dying. Yes, it did. Well, listen, it, we know something of love of dying. I, I hear these 
Medal of Honor, soldiers that gave their life uh, many times and their limbs to save their comrades. That congressman, there you heard him with a patch on his eye, and he said there was those that saved him and lost their life in saving his and saving others. The Bible says, for a righteous man or a good man, someone would even dare to die. But Christ loved us while we were his enemies. Amen. Thank you, Lord. While yet sinners, Amen. he died for us. Amen. But we can understand somewhat of the death of love. I believe every one of you parents that are here today, that you love your children enough Amen. that you would die for them. Amen. Amen. And I tell you what, you might not believe this, but uh, I would die for you, at least most of you. <laughs> <laughs> I would. You're worth more because I love you and I'm going to heaven anyway. Mm -hmm. So that just hit me, hit me a, maybe a floor higher. <laughs> but anyway, I want to get far away from you bottom floor people as I can. <laughs> Not that any of you are here. <laughs> but anyway, think about this. We understand something of a sacrificial love. Husbands and wives. I've heard heart-wrenching stories where the doctor said in childbirth, I can't save them both, either one or the other. And without fail, the mother, she was conscious. She said, save the child. Save the child. The husband didn't want to. Because he loved that wife. He had learned to love that baby like that. But he loved her and he begged her. I've seen that more than once. But she said, save the child. Mm -hmm. Let the child, the child live. That we know something of human sacrifice. But Paul came to Jesus and received him who died for him. And now he was called to live for the one who died for him. And he said, I died daily for Christ in 1 Corinthians 15, 31. He said, I'm alive to him, and he's alive to me. And a lot of people, they have a hard time giving God one and one and a half hours of, of God's time or time to God on Sunday morning. What a shame. Listen, these people in Revelation who overcame they love Jesus Christ more than their life itself. They loved him. So this number three, number one's the cross. Number two is the confession. Number three is all about commitment. They love not their life unto death. They, this verse began with they overcame. And then it gives these three things. They overcome. And so there's something you must have in your life to be an overcomer. We've got too many defeated Christians, too many unhappy Christians, too many professing Christians that are un un dis dissatisfied, disappointed. But something's wrong. Now, who's, who's the one wrong? Is it Christ or is it you? Amen. And you blame it on people? Who died on the cross for you, my dad said? Who are you serving anyway? Get at the cross and stay there till your life has changed. Amen. Listen, some people don't even pray five minutes a day. Some don't pray five minutes a week. Yeah. Some professing Christians don't pray at all unless they're in trouble. Some people have never tried to win a soul to Christ. Some people have never really tied faithfully and long enough to prove that it works. Some people uh, have never made any great sacrifice for God or others in the name of Jesus. That's a fact. Why? They're not committed. They love not their life unto death. They was ready to die for Christ. Now that's true commitment. And many of them did. That's a fact. They were beheaded for Christ. 
They were burned at the stake, fed to the lions and wild dogs for the sport. They were soaked in pitch and used as human torches or burned alive. They were starved to death in prison. They were nailed to crosses. Their houses, their lands, their jobs and family were taken away from them and that many were driven into exile, never to return home again. They loved not their life unto death. They forsook all to follow Jesus. They had that kind of salvation. Amen. That's the real stuff, isn't Amen. it? Amen. The day reason a lot of us get tested like we do is to show if we got the real stuff or not. Amen. We're tested, tried, and proved, and if it's not tested, it can't be trusted. Amen. Roman Empire declared a day of the year where every person had to confess that Caesar was Lord or they'd be arrested, imprisoned, or killed in the, in the arenas or other places. And so they would bring these Christians up one by one, either confess Caesar is Lord, or you're going to die or be arrested or so forth. Well, anyway, they would say only Jesus is Lord. Most of them would not renounce Christ. And they paid the price for it. They chose only Jesus uh, to be their Lord and was willing to go to the death before they renounced him. That's a fact. Read Bafas's Book of Martyrs. Read Josephus. It's, it is still happening around the world even today. Christians are being beheaded in prison yes, for being nothing more than a Christian, just a Christian, but they won't deny him. Why don't people know that you're a genuine follower or anybody? Why, why don't they know that they're a genuine Christian? That Jesus had the answer, no fruit. No fruits, fruits is evidence. When I was a boy, my dad preached a sermon that he got the idea out of Reader's Digest. He preached out of the King James Bible, not Reader's Digest. But Reader's Digest had an article. If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Some of you might remember that. That's a great question. If you're on trial for being a Christian and you were brought into a courtroom, would there be enough evidence to, to convict you of being a general Christian? a genuine Christian. What makes you different from the world? Some people are more like the world than they are Jesus. And that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be so. So I'm asking you today to identify with the risen Christ. You may suffer for it. You may sacrifice, but it's worth it. Amen. It's worth it. Whatsoever you do for God, he said, is not in vain. I love Paul saying this. For me to live as Christ and to die in vain. He, he, listen, you're, you're not going to lose your salvation by the grace of God, but by the grace of God, you're to live for Him and uh, and uh, go to Je live to serve Jesus. Live to serve Jesus. Second Timothy two twelve. If I suffer with Him. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he'll also deny us. So live or die, we should be glorifying Christ by our life. Paul said, for me to live is Christ to die is gain. Think about that. If I die, I'm going to go to heaven to be with Jesus. That's a plus. But if I stay behind, I'm going to serve Jesus. And that's a plus. He had a no-lose salvation. So whether he's, you live or whether you die, do it for Christ. And it will not be in vain. You can be, a lot of people are rejected for Christ. They're misunderstood because of Christ. They're disliked because of Christ. And, and I'm not talking about being disliked because you're a foolish, stupid Christian. Excuse the language. But anyway, some people... 
get persecuted for their own dumbness and behavior. And some of you know what I mean. But I'm not talking about foolishness. I'm talking about sincere, devoted following of the Lord Jesus Christ. They identified with the cross, the blood of the Lamb. They, they had a confession, their word of their testimony. They had a commitment. They lived not unto their lives unto, uh, they lived not, they loved not their lives unto death. So you're in a position today, every one of us, to be an overcomer, which as we said in the beginning of the messages, to rule, to prevail, to be victorious in the circumstances of life. And remember last week we emphasized how important it was to change our perspective of Christ and to see him as he is and identify with him. He's the sovereign, almighty, fiery Lord of hosts, and we, he has all authority in heaven and earth. And he said we can be more than conquerors Amen. through him that loved us and gave himself yeah. for us. I'm just trying to be a coach today. I'm just trying to cheer you on. Not give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep your eyes on. It's all about focus. You know, it's who you keep your eyes on. If you take off Jesus, eyes off Jesus like Peter did in the stormy boat, you're going to sink. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And listen, take it from me. It isn't easy. It's not easy. Trials, tribulation, trouble, sickness, pain, suffering, and all the rest, and the devil shouting in your ear to quit, to right. give up, that he doesn't love you, and the word of God is not true. You just need to stand on the word of God. Amen. I believe it. I declare the name of Jesus and his blood, and it is written, and uh, as Billy Sunday said, if the stars fall, Keep serving God anyway. Don't give up. Don't give up. These last days, could I be a voice to encourage, and to encourage you, and not to, to look at the circumstances, to look at Christ. You look at the circumstances and the consequences, you'll fall. But keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep confessing Him. It is written in the name of Jesus. Confess his name. Confess his blood. Confess the word of God. There's power. Wonder-working power in the blood. Amen. In the name and in the word of God. You believe that? Say amen. 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 May we pray. I don't know what God's saying to you tonight or this afternoon, but God knows if you're discouraged. And I feel like in these last days i'm really called by god to turn your heart to jesus to give you a hand up to be a voice of encouragement i can't live it for you nobody else can but we can encourage you we can encourage you keep your eyes on jesus not on men not on situations that you don't understand just say god i'm trusting you come what may Oh, Lord, speak to heart today. If there's one here, Lord, who's not saved, their name's not in the Lamb's Book of Life. They've never repented of sin truly. They've never trusted Christ truly. They've never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and called him Lord. And I pray that they will today, Lord. They will today. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I repent of my sin. I trust you. To save my soul, take me to heaven when I die. You believe that he is Christ, and he died on the cross and was buried and rose again. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then, Lord, we're living in day, the last days. It's so easy to get discouraged and to give up. And, Lord, these people here today are survivors. Oh, they've come through a lot. Everyone, every family here. My, 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 my. They've gone through so much trials and tribulations and others that aren't able to be here. Lord, like Sister June, 
and others, Lord, that are suffering. Oh, God, we pray you help them and lift them up. Oh, heaven will sure be sweeter and more dear because of what we've gone through down here. And we can say as a song, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. In his name for his glory. Amen. 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 376. <clears throat> Thank you. 